This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Auto Repair Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Walker, with my co-host, Kim. And today, our guest is Cecil Bullard from the Institute for Automotive Business Excellence. And we are going to be talking about a very important topic when it comes to your marketing, and that is your phone skills. But before we get into that, I want to give a thanks to our sponsor. Thank you to our friends at RepairPal for providing you with this episode. RepairPal is the key that unlocks more business for your repair shop. Learn more at repairpal.com forward slash shops. Well, hi, Cecil. Howdy. We are sitting inside of the Institute in Ogden, Utah. Beautiful facility. Thank you. And we were here a couple of years ago. You continue to make it even better. Keep trying to make it home. It's awesome. Yes, I really love it in here. Kind of jealous. I'm not going to lie. And really just a beautiful area. There's a lot of snow on top of the mountains right now. It's a pretty place. Yeah. So we thank you for welcoming us here. Thanks for coming out. You got, you're the guys that travel. Oh my gosh. We do travel. 5,283 miles, I think on this trip, five weeks. And did we figure out that we're sleeping in 13 places in five weeks? That's cool. Something like that. Kind of crazy. So the reason that we are here is we, of course, do marketing at Shop Marketing Pros. And one of the things that we hear from people often is they will say, well, my ads aren't working or something, my marketing isn't performing or something like that. And we'll start listening into the calls because of course we record the calls. And one of the things that we hear is the phone skills are just really bad. Abysmal. I mean, we could go down a whole train of words describing it, but yeah. It's, it's problematic. It, it's funny to me, too, that every time that the marketing people get blamed, either we're not getting enough leads or the leads are bad leads. To me, it's almost like that Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross movie. I don't know if you've seen that. It's an old movie, but it's like they have the old leads that are horrible leads and they have the new leads, which are supposed to be good leads. And yeah. nobody wants the old leads, uh-huh. except when you answer the phone, how you answer the phone how you talk to people, how your marketing is set up, that's going to be the difference. You could close 5% or you could close 50%. Yeah. It's how you take care of them. Well, I know I've heard you say a ton of times before, and I remember the first couple of times I heard you say it, I'm like, I can't do that. That is so hard to do. But answer the phone with a smile on your face, right? Yeah, you I'm sure to. you're going to get into all that kind of stuff. But I know Brian and I were listening to a couple of calls where I remember thinking, this guy is not smiling. Bob's Automotive. For um, real. It, yeah. it, it sounds Sounds like they would rather be anywhere other than answering that phone call. There's multiple problems. So first of all, I hate my job. I hate this. I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And the phone is ringing and it's interrupting everything else I have to do. I've got five estimates to write. I've got text bugging me. I don't have the parts on that car. And my phone is ringing. How dare my phone ring? And so if I answer it, Bob's Automotive, maybe they'll go away. And then I can get back to the stuff that I have to do. Except I paid money to make that phone ring. The guy on the phone is worth, our average repair was $768. And we're talking almost 20 years ago. And so when that phone rang, I was like, that's $768. Exactly. Like, Thanks for calling this Cecil. How can I help or, you? Or even thinking, okay, the person on the end, other end of this line is writing my paycheck. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe this one says no. But that's another thing. I taught door-to-door sales for a couple of years. And if you want to learn like sales skills, go do door-to-door because that's just fun as heck for the right personality. (laughs) But there's these things that you can do like, okay, not everybody's going to like me. That guy's going to slam the door in my face. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. That means the next person's going to open the door, invite me in and feed me dinner. I mean, you know, it's it's amazing to me that we don't realize that that one person might be a jerk, might not be my client, but the phone's going to ring multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. We'll hear that from the client saying that the marketing is not performing. And then we hear their calls. And the thing is, is like people think, and I feel crazy saying this because I'm a marketer. I've made my living by doing marketing, but people think that marketing is the answer to the problem that they're having in their shop. They may have enough cars already right. if they would just get their phone skills right. But if they start spending money on marketing when their phone skills aren't right, that's just money that's going in the trash can. Because all you're going to do, you might bring in a few more people because of it. But if you get those phone skills right first, 
I, as a marketer, I'm going to be much happier because there's nothing I love more than seeing my clients where their marketing is just killing it. The marketing that we're doing is producing more cars in the shop, higher, you know, average repair order in some cases. And I want to see that. So I'm literally here on this podcast today to ask you to come on here because I want to tell people, get your phone skills right before you start doing marketing. So you could look at our whole industry and you could say, there are a bunch of people in our industry who it's a great industry. I love it. I work here. I've been here my whole life. I'm going to die in this industry. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. But there's a whole lot of people that don't really know their job or understand how to do their job. I would say it's owners. Frankly, we have a lot of owners that they don't understand their numbers. We have a lot of people answering our phones that they've never had somebody say, answer the phone this way. And you have a lot of people trying to convince that person not to give them a price on the phone, but to bring your car to my shop. And they don't know how to do it. We haven't taught them the skills to be successful. It'd be like, I don't know, maybe, you know, hey, there's a guy on the table. I want you to go do brain surgery. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, I know the brain's somewhere near the head. So I'll yeah. cut that part open. But once I get in there, now what? What do I do? And we need more training to be more successful. You know, we were just um, talking to a shop owner recently and so many shop owners, they think, well, it's my service advisor. It's just, they're not cut out for this. They're afraid to have the conversation and say, hey, your phone skills are not good and fix it. But what he learned was when he offered training to his service advisor, that service advisor felt so, I forget how he described mm -hmm. it, but he was so happy, so moved that he was being invested in yeah. and being trained how to do it. So happy. And think about the loyalty that you create in your team members when you invest in them that way. And now this guy's learning. And it was tiny little things that needed to be corrected and he just didn't even know. We need to make sure that our staff, that training is a part of our pay plans, that it's mm -hmm. a part of our company, that it's like in our deep in our culture, because the better we train our people to do the things that they need to do, like answering the phone and dealing with a phone shopper, et cetera, the more successful they're going to be. So now my marketing dollars make sense. I'm not going to blame my marketing people because my guy doesn't answer the phone well. I always talk in classes when I'm teaching, I talk about odds. So I say I'm an odds person, O-D-D-S, not odd. <laughs> Everybody knows I'm a little odd, but, but it's about improving your odds. So if you smile when you answer the phone, mm -hmm. the person on the other end of the phone is going to feel like, oh, they're interested in me. It's just, just these little bitty things that you can do that will improve your odds. So now I've got a 3% better chance, right? Just because I put a smile on my face. And it's funny. I always tell people when I'm teaching this, I say, think of a, a good joke. And my joke is always a nun, a priest, and a rabbi walk into a bar. <laughs> and, and I've always said that in class because it makes me smile. But there's no punchline on that. And then I was looking at a Gary Larson cartoon. I think it's Gary Larson. And it, it said a nun, a priest, and a rabbi walk into a bar. And they were laying on the ground, a nun, a priest, and a rabbi. And there was a bar sticking out of the wall. I thought, oh, that's great. Well, you, know? you just said that and we laughed. But yeah. Like, <laughs> but if you, it's like I always, you know, they think they got to answer the phone the second it rings. Don't answer the phone the second it rings. Take a moment, take a deep breath, think of a good joke, whatever your favorite joke is, think of that, and then pick up the phone and, and, and with a smile on your face, and there's a way to, to answer the phone. And everybody should have a process for answering the phone. It ought to be simple. It's four yeah. steps. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good day. Thank you for calling Larry's Auto Works. This is Cecil. How can I help? So introduction, some kind of a salutation. Thank them for calling your company. Tell them your name and then ask them a question. How can I help you today? What can I do for you? And it's funny because you teach this, you know, I could tell you right now, if you ever had anybody that worked for me and they answer the phone, they'd be like, good morning. Thank you for calling Larry's Auto Works. This is right. Cecil. How can I help you? And you practice it. You train on it. You do it again, you do it 5,000 times so that automatically my wife and I will be arguing about something. My phone will ring. I'll pick up the phone and I'll say, thank you for calling the Institute. This is Cecil. How can I help you? Big smile on my face. Right. And then, and I'll hang up the phone and, and I'll be like, okay. <laughs> and she goes, how can you do that? It's muscle memory. Yeah, yeah. You need to create muscle memory so that no matter what's going on around you, and if I call a shop, I can tell you, I call hundreds of shops. I'm sure you guys too. And it's so funny to me when they answer the phone. First of all, 80% of the time, 
it's obvious they don't want to answer the phone. Right. And yeah, there's a lot of crappy phone calls and there's a lot of people calling you that want to sell you marketing or they want to sell you insurance or, Mm -hmm. you know, phone systems or whatever. But that person could be that next $800 job, that next $5,000 job. And so you have to get yourself in a place where you put that smile on your face and you ask the questions. Then what does someone need to know? So I call the shop and I hear, this is Bob. And I'm like, oh, is this Tom's Auto Care? Right. You know, I want to know, did I get the right place? Because instantly I'm thinking, oh, crap, I dialed the number wrong. I transpose a number sometimes. Right. And oh, yeah, this is Tom's Auto Care. Oh, okay. My name's Cecil. Here's my problem. But you don't get that. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you don't get someone answer. Even so, your relationship right from the beginning starts off bad. And I watch service advisors chase the person off the phone. And they use price a lot to do it. Yes. Because we know if we say, well, that's normally about 600 bucks, the guy's going to hang up, right? Mm -hmm. And so why would I do that? If I want this guy in my shop, why would I tell them, oh, that's about 600 Mm bucks? Why not engage him? Why not find out what they're interested in? What is it that we create a thing called a unique selling proposition? So if I talk marketing, we start at the website. What do I want my website to look like? Who do I want it to attract? You know, do I want it to attract the guy that is the cheapest guy in the world or do I want it to attract, you know, someone that wants to take care of their BMW or their Mercedes or their Honda, right? And so my website is designed in a specific way so that, and my marketing, my SEO, my SEM is designed to attract specific people. That's why we use keywords and all of that. So if if that worked right and I pick up the phone right and I start in the right place with this person... I'm five steps ahead of any other shop they're going to call, most likely, right? For sure. And so what experience are they getting when they call my shop as opposed to what experience are they getting when they call other shops? Mm -hmm. And if I can engage that person, create questions that I would ask. So, you know, I want to know how much a water pump is. Well, I know price is important to you. But before we talk about that, why don't you let me tell you why we do what we do here and how we do it. So this is the kind of shop we are. These are the kind of clients that we work with. We find that these people are most happiest in our shop, blah, blah, blah. And this is what I can do for you. Now, does that make sense? Right. Is this something that would be attractive to you? Right. And you ask these questions that get the person to say, yeah, I think I'd like that. Mm -hmm. And so if we for most of the people, like if we did a marketing survey And we said, okay, what percentage of the population are cheap because they were born that way, right? They drive out of their way to save two cents a gallon Mm -hmm. on gas, right? And so you'd say, okay, maybe that's 1%, right? Mom dropped them on their head when they were little. The chemicals aren't right, whatever that is, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, so that leaves me 99%. And then we have some people that are cheap out of necessity. Mm -hmm. So they're broke, their job isn't a great job. They don't have enough money, whatever. And so if I go back, so the 1% that are cheap, is that someone I want standing at my counter? And the answer is no, right? right? I'm going to waste my time with that person. So if I find out you're really cheap, hey, I know the cheapest shop in town. Here's their phone number. I know they can take care of you. I know you'll be happy there. I'm off the phone, gets them off quickly, solves their problem. They don't go online and write a nasty, he wouldn't help me, wouldn't give me a price, blah, blah, blah. Now I still have 99%. So today, what percentage of the population is cheap out of necessity? Okay. So they could be good customers. They would really love to be driving a better car. They would love to be at a shop that gives them great service, but they just don't have the money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are those my customers? Well, maybe not today, but they could be in the future. So I want to treat them really nice, but maybe, and maybe bring them in at least to do a service and get the car looked at and create a plan for them. Mm -hmm. So, but let's say that there's 15%, 16% of the population is cheap out of necessity. That leaves me like 83%, 82% of the population that wants what I have, which is great service, a good product, honesty, a relationship, someone that will talk to them and help them. You want to be the coach and the consultant for your client. That's who you should be if you're a shop or your service advisor. They're calling you. Mm -hmm because they don't know enough about their car to make the decisions. They want that information from you and they want you to help them make good decisions. And if that's what they really want, why not talk about that? Why not say, we do business this way and we like to inspect the car and then we'll come back and we'll give you a list of things that we find. And that way you'll have the information that you need to make good decisions, right? Why not reinforce that with them throughout our conversation? 
If you do that and you have a methodology and a methodology that you practice, so I have a unique selling proposition. I understand what 83% of the population is really looking for. I know how to talk about that and ask the right questions. The more I do that, what happens to my odds of bringing that person in the shop? It goes up and up yep. and up and up. And so when I listen to phone calls, and these are actually service advisors that some of which have been in our programs, mm-hmm. and then I listen to their phone call, I just want to go smack them upside the head and say, wait a minute, we taught you better. Yeah. But I also understand having been a service advisor, how stressful that job can be and how you get kind of caught up in everything that's going on. There's so much to do yeah. and that phone rings and it's like, oh my God, I wish that damn thing would stop ringing. We have to have a switch, right? That we mm-hmm. can switch off and go, these are my clients. I paid repair shop marketing pros to get these people to call me mm-hmm. and now it's up to me to do the best I can to get them to bring their car to my shop so I can build a relationship with them. Our friends at RepairPal are making today's episode possible. Don't lose work to your competition. Today's consumers check pricing during all stages of the repair process, before, during, and after. Did you know that 81% of them do online price comparisons before making a purchase, and customers that check your price after they've already authorized the work do so after calling the competition? But RepairPal, the largest auto repair network, has a solution. Their fair price estimator tool can be put on your website to help you build trust with consumers up front to demystify price, help educate consumers about what's involved in the repair, bring you higher web traffic, and prevent your customers from calling your competition. You have to be in it to win it, so head on over to RepairPal.com forward slash shops and set up a call to learn more about becoming RepairPal certified. When you sign up, you'll get one month of service free and save $150 off certification. That's RepairPal.com forward slash shops. You just brought up something important is we talk a lot about when you put together a marketing campaign, let your whole team know so they know what's going on. I wonder how many of the service advisors have no idea that there are ads running out there, that the shop owner is paying to make that phone ring, which it shouldn't matter, right? The phone rings, you need to treat each person the same, but something I feel psychologically has to happen when they understand, oh, wait. My shop owner is paying for this phone ring. Let me just flip that switch like you were talking about. I think when you talk about culture, like your culture of your business, we need to understand something about all our businesses, your business, mine, any shop in the world. The customer is the one that pays your bills. Mm -hmm. So the owner is not paying your salary. Mm -hmm. The guy on the phone or the gal on the phone is the one paying your salary. Absolutely. And so... And so when we start building culture in our business, I want everyone in my company to understand what we do and why we do it and how we do it. And I want them also to understand how valuable each and every client is to us, right? Because if we don't do a good job for our clients and we don't treat them well, then I've got to spend 10 times more money on marketing. And don't Mm -hmm. get me wrong, I don't Mm -hmm. mind spending the money if it's going to get the result. But if we're just turning people over, like if the phone's just ringing and we're going, Bob's and chasing them away, I don't want that. I want good morning, you know, thank you for calling. Well, you know, one of the shop owners we were talking to, Brian actually talked to him, was so embarrassed. I don't think he knew that the service advisors were answering like that. I would tell you the mistake again is always owner's fault. So whoever is managing the shop, whether it's an owner or manager, it's their responsibility to make sure and do what we would call random QC. So not only do I want to call my shop occasionally and not use my cell phone so I can Mm -hmm. see how they're answering the phones, but I also might want some people I know to call my shop or I might want to call later and say, oh, how did they answer the phone? How did that make you feel? Well, how did they talk to you about pricing? How did that make you feel, right? And start to understand because if they're not answering the phones, it's been that way for a long time. Either I didn't teach them right in the first place or somebody decided whatever they taught me isn't worth it. I'm just going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. And if we're not paying attention to that, again, we have to manage, right? We have to be aware of what's really happening around our business. And so being embarrassed, like when you told me this earlier, I was like, oh, you shouldn't be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And he really shouldn't. Just fix it, right? If you're not able to train them, we have some great online training We have a fantastic service advisor program. In my opinion, it's the best in the world, frankly. And our results speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. But you need to pay attention to what's going on in your shop. And unfortunately, we have a lot of owners. They're so busy 
working on a car so that they can get the money to pay the bill so that they can make sure they got rent money and et cetera, that they're not paying attention to things like how do we answer the phone? And the phone, throw away every tool you have in your toolbox. The phone is the most important tool you have in your company, period, because that's where you start with all communication. I mean, there are a few people that will go online and make an appointment. But if you're a shop that doesn't then call those people and say, oh, I see you have an appointment on Tuesday. We're going to really look forward to seeing. Let me tell you what we do. You come in, you park here, do this. And oh, by the way, blah, blah, blah. Now, do you know how to get to us exactly? You know, you just have this little Mm -hmm. pre-conversation. And if you're not doing that, then you're not using the most valuable tool you have, which is those wrenches don't mean anything if that customer doesn't call and come into your shop. So I want to talk about that idea for just a little bit more where you're talking about the owner's responsibility, because I'm a big advocate of extreme ownership. I think that it is something where when you're at the top, you're responsible for absolutely everything. And you also mentioned how you've heard calls and you're like, this is one of the service advisors we've trained and you under during his neck. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is just a fact of life is that we learn things, we go do them, and then we can fall back into our old ways. Yeah. And it is the owner's responsibility to make sure that that doesn't happen. So how often do you feel like owners should be spot checking these calls and how many should they be listening to? So I could give you an example of work order quality control. So I looked at, we did 13 cars a day, five days a week. So 65 cars. Average week, 65 cars. I pulled 10 to 15 work orders every week. And not only did I look at the work order, make sure that it was the signatures were there, the pricing was there, the descriptions were right, the parts were on there, that our margins were correct. But I also looked at what did we find on the car? What did we recommend to the customer? If they didn't buy it, did it get it on as a recommendation? And I did that after doing it every day for 60 days. So create the habit, find the problem, solve the problem, create the habit, create the habit, create the habit, and then do random QC. So I would tell you that at least once a week, I should make a couple of phone calls or have somebody call to my shop or I should be checking on how the phone was answered. Now, today, most systems are VoIP systems and most VoIP systems have a way to record the phone call. So I don't even have to call my shop. You know, I can go online and listen to that phone call. And if I don't want to listen to the whole phone call, which by the way, there's more bad than good from what I've seen, frankly, I can listen to how they answer the phone and go to the next one, see how they answer the phone. And I could do that for five minutes once a week. And I know whether or not the phones are being answered correctly. Now, the other thing is not only do we need to do that, but we need routine training. So we need to be talking about it in our company meetings. I need to be having the conversation like, hey, you know, I've been listening. We're not answering the phone right. How should we answer the phone if we want to be the best shop in the world? So, and by the way, I don't wake up any morning to be second at anything. And I'm pretty sure, Brian, you and I were in that same place, right? (laughs) For sure. (laughs) So I want to answer the phone better than any other shop. And so I'm going to routinely train. And if people aren't, I'm going to solve the problem. It's up to me. I own the company, extreme ownership, right? Yep. And I have all the tools. It's what, again, I need to create habit. We're all creatures of habit. And if your habit is, oh, that car came in, I better go look at it. And you're the owner, then you got something that's not right. Okay. Mm-hmm. You need to create habits about, I need to look at work orders randomly. See how we wrote them up. See, I need to look at inspections randomly. Did we do a good inspe- thorough inspection on the car? I mean, what's my job here? When the customer drops their car off, am I a half-ass mechanic or am I a, a really good technician? Are we a great shop or are we a crappy shop? Yeah. Right? And a great shop, how does a great shop answer the phone? You know, good morning. Thank you for calling Larry's Auto Works. This is Cecil. How can I help you? I cannot tell you how many times I had customers go, Man, it sounds like you guys are really having fun today. And I'm like, you bet. It's great great here, right? You know, even if it was the crappiest day in the world, because that's what you need to portray. Yeah. At our shop, we would answer, good morning. This is Brian. Pick up. I'm sorry. It's been so long. It used to be happy. There you go. Say, Good morning, Peak Automotive. This is Brian. I can help you. And people would actually respond to that sometimes. The whole, I can help you. They'd be like, I like that. Great. Mm -hmm. That's this. That's why I called. Right. You know, and I always say end with a question because the data basically says that if you end with a question, you are in charge. So it puts you in control. It's kind of like sitting on the right of somebody gives you an advantage in a sales situation because 
most people are right-handed. Most people will look to their right for yeah. them. So there's all these little psychology. stupid psychology and <laughs> physical, you know, body language things. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you and I are talking and I need you to say yes, you know, I might say, oh, you know, why don't we get you scheduled in? Does, it, does that make sense? And when I'm doing that, my eyebrows are going up, even if I'm on yeah. the phone and I'm shaking my head, yes, because that's going to send a message through the wires mm-hmm. to whoever's on the other end of the phone And now it's, I'm in charge. It's your turn to say yes. Right. And so there's these little, again, it's, it's all about the odds, right? The more it's like working on a car. You know, when I first started working on cars, I didn't know as much as I know today. And so I broke some things and I kind of learned that, okay, you can only torque it so far, right? You (laughs) can only turn the gun up so high. You can only do this. And as you work on the car, you learn secrets. You like, oh, if I do this before when I'm working on, say, I'm going to pull the calipers off. If I spray them with W, the bolts with Mm WD-40, they come off easier. Oh my gosh. Right. And I won't have to fight it. So you learn these little tricks to being a really good technician. Well, if you're going to be a salesperson and you're going to be a person who answers the phone, shouldn't you learn the little tricks to doing that and then making yourself like the best phone answerer ever? Well, it's funny you say that because there's people I've met in person and then I'll be on the phone call with them and it totally does not match up. And I'm like, some people just have that weird like phone. They just don't like talking on the phone. RBF, or, yes. But in but on the phone. <laughs> yes, right? exactly. Yeah. So it's not always this major overhaul that has to happen. Sometimes it's just a couple of tips. A couple of small things. things, right? A couple of small yeah. things. And you decide the kind of customers you want to work with. You decide the kind of mm-hmm. shop you want to be. You design your marketing around that. People call, you answer the phone the way that you think that most of those people would like to hear and you'll be more successful. We'd like to complicate the heck out of it. Like, oh, that guy must, he's much better at answering the phone than I am. Yeah, of course I am. I've answered the phone 800 million times in a shop and I've learned what I need to learn. And you would, you like your kids, right? Your kids, you like when they're going to ride their bike, you want to tell them how to balance and how to ride it and all of that but you know they're going to fall down. They have to. Mm -hmm. And you would hope that they would learn exactly everything that you taught them just by you doing it, but you watch your kids grow up and they have to go out and test things, et cetera. Oh my gosh. Yeah, makes you nuts. In my business, I think I have a little more control that and I can say, okay, here's why we want to answer the phone that way. Here's the benefit of doing that, right? Well, another reason for training is because, again, just like with our kids, we can tell our son something But then when you tell him the exact same thing, some light switch goes off. So you could have a shop owner who's trying to explain that to their service advisor, but then they send them off to training and they realize you took the time to explain the psychology behind it or the why or whatever. It's amazing. I can't tell you how many times I've sat with the husband and wife and I'm talking to the husband. I'm saying, well, we got to do this or whatever. And he goes, oh, yeah, that makes sense. You see the wife just go smack (laughs) because... She's told him 15 times, but he's not listening, right? And sometimes it takes someone else to get the point across. Yeah. We have people that have come here, they've sent their service advisors here, and their service advisors will say, oh, now I know what he's been trying to get me to do in the shop because we're reinforcing what the owner is trying to get accomplished in their business. And to me, I don't know how much, I mean, I do know how much marketing costs. I don't know exactly what your program costs, but it's not cheap to have a website and do SEO, SEM, social media, all of that. I remember the old days where we didn't have any marketing. I mean, I had a inline Yellow Pages ad a thousand years ago, Mm -hmm. but the community was small enough that word got around that if you wanted someone to work on your car, you went to Cecil because Cecil was the best. And by the way, Cecil was my dad. We're not talking about me here. Mm -hmm. And then the community got bigger. Our world has gotten so much bigger and it's not so much who you know, it's almost now I'm going to go online. I'm going to look for that person. If you're at the right place online, I need a new dentist. Not that I have a dentist. I'm not very comfortable with him. And so I'm looking for a new dentist. Where do I go? I pull up the thing. I go to the maps. I look at, there's three guys there. One of them I know is a, is like a chain dentist. And so I'm not calling that one. And the other two, one guy's got 4.8 stars. The other's got five stars. The guy's got 4.8 has six things and six comments. The other guy's got 253 five-star recommendations. Yeah. I call them up. I don't know who they are Mm -hmm. and whoever answers the phone, how the phone is answered, how that person deals with me is whether or not I'm going to go in there and spend 10 to $20,000 on my teeth or not. Okay. So we need to make sure that our people, extreme ownership, 
are in the right place in their head. What kind of shop do we want to be? And if we want to be that kind of a shop, how does that kind of a shop answer the phone? And if right? you have a service advisor who's having a bad day, you can't afford to let take them off the phone. Stay. Take, take them off the phone. phone. Send them home for the day. Holy! I used to tell my people, if you're going to have a crappy day, you, you got one of two things. If your wife yelled at you or you got in an accident on the way to work, you, mm-hmm. one of two things. Leave it in the trunk of the car, mm-hmm. right? And then put the duck suit on, yeah. right? I always talk about a duck suit, right? Yeah. So And smile and be happy or go home for the day. Yeah. Because... How many times is my phone going to ring today? Mm -hmm. 50, 60, 70 times. I mean, and every time I answer that phone, it's an opportunity to bring somebody in that's going to be my next evangelist customer that's going to drive $100,000 worth of business through my company. I don't think we look at it that way on a micro level. And I don't think we look at it on a macro, a Mm -hmm. big level. Mm -hmm. I think we think, oh, it's just the phone ringing, but it isn't. Yeah. And if they came in annoyed, aggravated, frustrated, whatever it is, and they view the phone call as a disruption, an interruption, that level 10 frustration is going to just increase with every single phone call. So you got to capture that early. Your, your body language and your tone of voice and how you speak to anybody. It's funny. I never raise my voice. Never once do I raise my voice. But I can tell you right now, I can get really damn serious if I want to. Okay. And my wife will go, why are you raising your voice? I didn't raise my voice. I changed my tone. I changed my pitch. I changed my facial expression, right? And all of that sent a message to the other person that, frankly, if I'm mad at my wife, that's what I want her to hear or my kids, right? right? Or whatever. But on the phone with that potential customer, I don't ever want to go in that place. I always want to be the guy that can help. And I would say one of the other things I think that is a mistake we make is that most owners will tell the service advisor, Anyone that calls, I want them in the shop. And so that doesn't give the service advisor any leeway whatsoever. And I think that if we're a really good shop, we find a shop that is cheap in our neighborhood. We go in to meet the owner. We get the phone number so that when I run across somebody that will not be happy in my shop. I mean, if you want coaching, we're not the most expensive coaching company. We're also not the cheapest. But if you want the cheapest coaching, I know who that guy is. I'll happily give you their phone number. Because you won't be happy with what I'm going to give you because it's going to cost you more than you think you want to pay. It's the same in a shop. One of my jobs, I have two jobs on the phone, period, as a service advisor. My first job is to make sure that you are our customer and that you'll be happy with what we can do for you. So we have to have some discussion about what we do, why we do it, how we do it. And the second job is to get you in to my shop and get an appointment. Those are my only two jobs. And when you realize that this person I'm talking to will not be happy with what we're going to do for them, right? We have a beautiful shop. People walk in our office and they go, of course, the outside of the building is pretty bad right now, but they walk into our office and they go, oh my gosh, this is fantastic, right? That's what we want you to do. We want you to, because it puts you in a place, that's where we want you to be. And we need to think about that in our own businesses. And when we realize that's not the person, I want to be helpful. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to be mean. It sounds like this is what you're looking for. Here's the phone number. And we need to teach all our people how to do that and give them the ability to do that. So that's a great segue. I have four situations that I'd love to ask you about. So, all right, the first one. How do you handle callers who think that they're calling another shop or they think they're calling the dealership? Oh, yes. So usually I can tell because I'm going to, you're going to give me a list of whatever, right? How much I've got this list. My first question whenever that comes up is, where's the car at? Well, I, I've got, right now it's at the dealership. Or who gave you the list? Well, I got it at so-and-so shop. I says, okay, did they give you prices on things? Yeah, they told me what it would take. How come you didn't take your car there? Right? That's the magic question, mm-hmm. right? I have had so many people call me from the dealership. Hey, I need a coolant flush and a brake flush and a brake job and this and this. And I need pricing. And I'm like, where's the car? Oh, it's at the dealership. Oh, let me explain something. We get a lot of cars from the dealership. Frankly, we don't always agree with them on what the car needs. And my techs are so good on BMW that they're probably going to find some things the dealership guys missed. Let me tell you what we do here and why we do it the way we do it. And then we have a short conversation. And then I say, I can get you in on Tuesday or Wednesday. Which one's better for you? Right? And then you shut your mouth and let them answer. Oh, no, I just want some prices. Okay, great. 
there's four or five other questions that I might ask. So when you think about automotive service and repair, what's the most important thing to you? And the customer will tell you, well, I'm, I'm only looking for the cheapest price. Well, that's never going to be us. We're always going to be the best value for your dollar, but we're never the cheapest. If you really are looking for the cheapest shop, here's the shop. If you're looking for value, here's why we're valuable, right? We have a great warranty. We have master technicians and they're going to find the problem faster. We're going to look your car over. We're going to give you a list of things and we're going to help you understand why those things are important to your car so you can make an intelligent decision about your automotive service and repair. After all, isn't that what you want, right? And if you notice, I'm mm-hmm. again, mm-hmm. I'm, my head's shaking yes because I've trained myself when I'm asking those questions to shake yes. So if the car's in another place, I'm not going to talk bad about them, but I am going to say I don't agree. If you've had your car diagnosed somewhere else, I cannot fix whatever they've asked you to fix. And here's the real reason. So many times that car's come in and when we've looked at it, that thing is not what solves the problem. And if I spend your money on something that doesn't solve your problem, you're not going to be happy with me and I'm not going to be happy either. So we are going to do a proper diagnosis. And you learn these little scripts. So the least expensive way to have your car fixed is to have somebody who knows and understands the vehicle do a proper diagnosis. That way you don't spend money on something that won't solve your problem. Doesn't that make sense? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So again, you learn, I call them arrows. You create these little scripts out of your unique selling proposition. You know, why do we do it this way? How do we do it? Why is that important to a potential client? Right? And so I have stolen tens of thousands of cars from other shops and from dealerships only because I'm asking questions and finding out what the person really is looking for. And then I have the solution to that. The only solution I don't have is if you want the cheapest shop in town, that's not a solution I have here. Yeah. If you want quality work, if you want a good warranty, if you want someone that's honest, someone that's going to give you all the information, someone that's going to be your counselor, help you make good decisions. That's us, right? So I didn't want to stop you no. because that happens as well. Yep. But specifically in a situation where someone calls and they think, you know, they haven't even brought oh, their a car different in shop. Yeah. They They're think calling it's a Bob's shop. Automotive, but it's Cecil's because Automotive. Because what happens often, and I say this in jest, but I will often just say people are stupid. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, the fact is somebody might Google, for example, a Mercedes service. Well, if I as a marketer they think it's the dealership, if I as a marketer have done a great job, mm-hmm. then when somebody's doing a search for Mercedes service, then I come up your ads or your organic results are going to come up. They may be moving too quickly. They click on it, mm-hmm. they call you, and they think they're calling the dealership mm-hmm. or they think they're calling another shop. But you pick up on that when you answer. How do you handle that? So in the old days, when Yellow Pages was still a thing, so now we're going back twenty four yeah. years or whatever. Mm-hmm. Our main quarter page, half page ad wasn't, wasn't returning. So I got rid of it Mm -hmm. and I did line item ads. I bought all the URLs, toyotaautocare.com. I bought fordautocare.com. I bought bmwautocare.com. So I owned all those URLs and I went into the yellow pages and I ran those ads. So people would call thinking they were calling the dealer. And I would, they would say, are you the Mercedes dealership? I said, no, we're not the dealership, but we do have a Mercedes master technician here. So how can I help you? Well, I'm looking for blah, 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 warranty. Okay. Well, we can't help you with that. Here's the phone number to the dealership. And by the way, I had all the dealership phone numbers right next to me. That way I could quickly determine that they want the dealership. That's where I'm going to send them. Okay. But I would tell you 60% of the time, as long as I could answer their question and they felt like their car would be safe in my hands, I could get that appointment. So if you said, hey, I'm looking for Bob's Automotive, Cecil Automotive, I would very clearly say, we're not Bob's, but I can help you. Why are you calling, et cetera? And if they're insistent on calling Bob's, I'll say, here's Bob's phone number, if I can get it quickly. Or I'll say, well, we're not Bob's. So look them up. You got the wrong number. Sorry about that. Done. But I think the question becomes, is it Bob's you're really looking for? Are you looking for someone that can take care of your car? Yeah, I think that that is one of the most highly missed opportunities that I hear when people are calling. If somebody has a broken car, they're not going to call the dealership or some other shop unless they have a need. They And if I can figure out what that need is and I can meet that need, and that's a short, com- that's not a 10 minute conversation. Mm-hmm. Right. I would also tell you, if you're on the phone for more than about three minutes with any customer, your odds of getting them in the shop go down 
by the second mm-hmm. until they're almost zero. The longer the call, the worse your odds are of getting them in the shop. All right, so next situation, you're on a call, you are the only person there, and you start getting another call. What do you do? So bird in the hand, we're two in the bush. This person in front of me is here, their car's here, they're gonna spend money here. When someone shows up to your shop and hands you their keys, they already know they're spending money. The, now the negotiation is how much, okay? So that phone call, however, is also very important. So if I've built a relationship with you, so Brian, geez, I'm really sorry. I'm the only person here. I've got to pick up the phone. Can you give me just a second? Now, by the way, the phone's rang three times. I'm picking them the fourth or the fifth. You know, good morning. Thank you for calling Larry's Auto Works. This is Cecil. How can I help you? Well, I need blah, blah, blah. I'm very sorry right now. I'm tied up with a client. Is there any chance I can get your phone number and call you back within 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. right? I get off the phone, I turn to you, and I say, I'm very sorry for that. I really apologize. Where were we, Brian? I ask a question to get us back to the place that we were. And by the way, if, if, if I don't feel like I can do that, I have an answering machine that will pick that up. And I hate answering machines yeah. and answering services. I think a human should pick up the phone 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. I just understand that there are a lot of shops out there where the owner is working on cars, answering phones, or the service advisors, you know, doing multiple duties. And sometimes that phone's going to ring when I have someone in front of me. Yeah. I just make sure. And by the way, if you told me, no, I don't want you to pick the phone up. I would say, okay, and I wouldn't pick the phone up. I'd let it go. Yeah, and for God's sakes, please, if you have an answer machine, yeah, have a message recorded. That's yeah. a whole other thing. And don't tell me how much you care about me. Just say, we apologize. We're very sorry that we can't get to the phone right at the moment. I guarantee that you'll have a phone call back within 20 minutes or whatever it yeah. is. Please leave your name and number, and I'll get right back to you. Yeah. And keep a smile on your face. Keep it light. Yeah. yeah. No record ro- robot recordings. Yeah. Right. Absolute biggest mistake that I hear when listening to calls is people not asking for the appointment. There's funny, there's a commercial on one of the conservative. I happen to be a bit conservative. We won't have that conversation, (laughs) but it's this guy, 90% of sales calls never get answered in 90% of the salespeople don't answer 80% of the time. And he goes on and on. And Mm -hmm. I keep thinking, yeah, well, 95% of the time, nobody asks for the appointment. So when you're teaching phone sales, if somebody says how much for a water pump, my first thing is, well, I can get you in on Tuesday or Wednesday morning. Which one would be better for you? I'm asking for the appointment before we even have the rest of the conversation yeah. because 5% of the people will make that appointment. And that's 5% less conversations I have to have. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just going to go right to the appointment. If you're not, I told you about arrows and I told you, you need to learn these like little scripts. These are my closing scripts. These are my, how do I get you to give me the meat of what you're really concerned about script? But there's also the close, which is at the end of every question, right? So you say, hey, Cecil, do you guys have mechanics know what they're doing? You know, I really want a place I can trust. Oh, you really owe it to yourself to go online and look at our reviews. We have 283 reviews, five stars, right? You you read it. You really owe it to yourself to come in. By the way, I can get you in on Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning. Which one is best for you? When I teach class, we'll ask, there'll be like 10 different scenarios. And at the end of every scenario, every time you deliver, it's, I can get you on Tuesday or Wednesday. Which one would be best for you? Mm -hmm. Right? Over and over and over. And you're talking to the service advisor and you're like, do you guys see a pattern here? You know, are you understanding that the close, ask for the appointment. I've listened to, my wife says I exaggerate. All my kids say exaggerate. But I'm not exaggerating when I say I've listened to over 10,000 service advisor phone calls. And out of 10,000 service advisor phone calls, I can probably count on two hands and one foot the number of times somebody said, would you like to bring the car in? Okay. Or I can get you on Tuesday or Wednesday. It blows my mind. I'll listen to a 13 minute conversation and never once does the person on the phone who's answering the phone say, would you like to bring the car in? Yeah. I want it to be so natural to you. So I want you to practice it 10,000 times Mm -hmm. that I can get you on Tuesday or Wednesday, which one's best, right? Just over and over and over. If you're on a phone call with me and we go the distance, which the distance for me is about five minutes. And in that five minutes, I've asked you, you've asked me four or five times for price. We're going to get to the very end, right? I'm done because I've realized that you're probably not looking for what I got. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to say this, you're going to ask me for price the fifth time. And I'm going to say, are you looking for the best value or the cheapest price? 
That's going to be my last question. Mm -hmm. And you're going to say, Cecil, I want both. And I have an answer for that. Or you're going to say, I'm looking for value. Great. You got the right spot. We do this, this, and this. This is why we're valuable. Let's get you in. I got Tuesday or Wednesday. We're going to have that conversation. If you say I'm looking for the cheapest price at the fifth time I ask you the question, I'm going to give you the phone number to another shop. I'm done because I'm not going to waste more time with somebody that I don't have what you want. Imagine that you had a shoe store and I walked in and I said, I'm looking for Levi's, right? And then we had a 15 minute conversation and you tried to sell me shoes for 15 minutes. And how insane would that be, right? I go to a restaurant, steakhouse, there's Longhorn right here. And I go in and I say, I want egg rolls, right? They're like, I'm sorry, sir, we don't have egg rolls, right? And I keep arguing about egg rolls and they keep talking to me about egg rolls, trying to sell me something else. Well, if my heart's set on egg rolls, I'm not going to eat at Longhorn today. I'm going to eat somewhere else. We think we need to close every phone call. In fact, I would tell you, if we close 30% of the people calling us on the phone, that's a great number to, to strive for. So three out of 10 phone calls, I ought to make an appointment with. Now, by the way, that's not my clients. I should close 100% of those. Mm -hmm. But that's people that have never been to my shop, that don't know me. Three out of 10 times, I ought to get that person in the shop. And if I do that, there'll be more car count than I can handle in my shop, in my business. Well, you have brought a ton of value to the listeners today. I hope so. Um, It truly is one of the most valuable things that you can do is get those phone skills right. If someone wants to take your phone skills classes, how do they do that? We are the institute.com. We have an online gearforshops.com, which is where we have all of our online education. There is a phone shopper class in there. I think it's about two hours long. I don't know what it costs, $159, 119 We might be selling it for 79 right now. I don't pay attention to that stuff anymore. Yeah. Not my job. But they can go online and and buy that class. And I think once they've bought it, they have access to it as many times as they want to go through it. And then they can do in-person classes as well. We actually have a service advisor training here next week on Friday and Saturday, two days. We do four of those a year where we will cover... Part of it is about helping service advisors understand why they need to price the way they need to price, helping them build their own confidence in what they do. Part of it is about sales skills. How do I ask the right questions? What are the right questions? How do I build my arrows? You know, what do I do? And then some of it is helping them understand their position and what they're supposed to do in their job. And we have a program, a service advisor training program. Month to month, they have their own coach. We listen to their phone calls. We go through the information with them, et cetera. And so you can do classes, come here and see us. We often do stuff on the road at Vision or ATE or Apex. You can go online and purchase classes. We actually have some free stuff on our YouTube channel, the Institute YouTube, and or you can join our service advisor program. It's a very popular program. We have fantastic results. Our average client gets an 18.3% net profit out of their business. And we see average repair orders go up about $160 when we've worked with service advisors. And we actually see gross margin go up about 9% on average. That's huge. So yeah, yeah, in in shops. We're going to put all of those links in the show notes. So you can find that at uh, shopmarketingpros.com forward slash podcast or whatever you're listening on. But thank y'all again for listening. Cecil, I should ask, is there anything that you would like to say to, you know, before we close No, off. I think we're good. Thank you for the opportunity of okay. uh, letting me speak and yeah. letting me do what I do best. Honestly, I think we're going to, like, this is going to be part of our onboarding for new clients doing digital ads is, hey, you need to listen to this stuff because it's really good. We having, hear these all Having the time. a good service advisor training ought to be, mm-hmm. any marketing company ought to be saying, wait a minute, let's make sure that when they answer the phone, they know yep. what to do. Yep. For sure. Well, thank y'all again for listening to another episode of the Auto Repair Marketing Podcast. We are just at one podcast on the Aftermarket Radio Network. You can find all of the podcasts at aftermarketradionetwork.com. We hope to have you listen again next week. And until then, go fill those bays. You've been listening to the Auto Repair Marketing Podcast with Kim and Brian Walker. Follow the podcast on your favorite listening app. Find their emails in the show notes and visit them at shopmarketingpros.com. Let Kim and Brian know what you want discussed because they're all about advancing the aftermarket.